Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Good morning, folks. It's a, a beautiful fall day. Everybody should just be so happy, extra hour of sleep, and yet when I was standing at the door, I think the extra sleep had a negative effect on them. <laughs> come dragging in, you need to kick up your heels a little bit and come alive. Whew. This coming week, Becky wants you to have your boxes all in, and on Wednesday, uh, the 6th, at 6.30, the women are going to gather, men are not allowed. We'll get even with them in time. Uh, cause, and they said, if you, you girls that are going to come and help and get all these Christmas boxes ready to go, there's no child care, so you have to make arrangements for that. And you, you can either bring an appetizer or a dessert. And I think probably we need men at the door to check on that, but just to make sure, yeah, so I bet we can get some volunteers, yeah, for that, all right. By the way, we're, we're, we are going to have a Thanksgiving dinner here, and um, tickets are available at five bucks a piece. If you can't afford it, well, we'll give you one, but the, pr the reason we know that we made a decision to go ahead and do that is uh, Patrick has been approved to get his U.S. visa, and I'll pick him up at the airport Monday evening at 7 o'clock, and he'll be here for a month, and he will be the program for the Thanksgiving dinner. And what we want to do is we want to take some time for you to ask. He, he could do a little presentation, and we want you to ask questions, whatever you, ever question you, and, and he'll be prepared to to deal with that because and and we may be able to have Eddie on the because he was turned down now and for no good reason other than our state department are idiots and I'm bragging on them that's uh, that's being nice what they've done is our state department goes to African nations I know two of them others I don't know but I know they went to Kenya and I know they went to Uganda and said essentially this if you want foreign aid from the US you have to agree to to homosexual marriages you have to agree to abortion you have to agree that the, the list of things the president of Kenya spoke first and said hey look that may be fine for you in the US but not here and besides that China will give us all the money we want Uganda president, even though he's a military dictator, said essentially the same thing. And when we were there in January, the, um, the old guy that ran the children's home where Patrick and Eddie grew up, he was talking to about 2,000 people there on our campus. And he said, look, the AIDS thing wiped out so many of our men we need families, we need babies to grow, we need da-da-da-da-da. We don't need abortion, we need babies, we need families. We need Christian families. And it, it, was, and it was all being, they was in, in Luganda, but sitting beside, Eddie was sitting beside of me, translating what he said. And uh, I couldn't help but be proud of him because they turned, they turned down money to maintain Christian convictions. And that's usually when you can tell the difference between the real and the unreal. If they're willing to turn down money in order to maintain their convictions, you know that they're sincere. So that's, that's essentially why. And uh, it was difficult to get one of them approved. We had two local politicians or in the House of Representatives that went that made telephone calls and and so they 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 agreed to let one come and not the other because believe it or not churches like ours are monitored pretty closely by the powers that be they know they know where we stand 
and uh, it'll be interesting to see. But anyway, uh, if if you want to have a family table with your name on it, that's fine too. We'll put you. You just let it uh, write down table and and uh, give her forty bucks, and we'll put your name on the table. That'll be reserved for you. Otherwise, it's open seating. The text that I have this morning is. Uh, not an easy one because the book of Galatians is not an easy one to handle. You need to understand that uh, that they they had a serious problem, one that should never have occurred, but it was there. And as it is even today, if you repeat something wrong often enough, it becomes accepted as okay. And so. What had happened is the Apostle Paul had gone to what is today southern part of Turkey in a place, in a a section that would be kind of like a small state called Galatia. It's a province, Roman province called Galatia. He had established several churches there, several congregations in different cities. He had come back to Jerusalem, and while he was back there, he, they had sent an emissary, and he learned that there had been a group of Christians, converted Jews, who had gone to the churches in Galatia and said, Look, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We believe that. And what the Apostle Paul told you is true, but he should have added that you need to be circumcised. Now what this would have done is it would have made Christianity a subtype of Judaism. Because Judaism, like Christianity, unfortunately, has a lot of different sectarian groups. Just as we have Methodists, Baptists, Episcopalians, so on and so forth. They had Sadducees, Pharisees, they had the Essenes, they had the Zealots, they had at least four that we know about and probably some others that we don't even know about. What they were doing was, was in my opinion, and, and nobody has asked me, I'm just volunteering, in my opinion, what they were doing amounted to heresy because it undercut the fact that Jesus and faith in Jesus alone is the, to- is the will of God. Now what we even struggle with today in churches, we still struggle with this. Even though the Bible is abundantly clear. When Jesus was standing before Pilate and Pilate was saying, hey, are, are you an insurrectionist? Are you creating, uh, op- opposing Rome? Blah, blah, blah. And Jesus said, no. Well, are you a king? Yes, I am a king, he said. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. I'm in no way competing with Rome or Jerusalem or anywhere else. I'm not. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. And the kingdom of this world... Is, in, is constantly fighting it because the natural tendencies of the flesh. Then when that term flesh is used, Matthew has mentioned this and it needs to be repeated. Actually, a heresy developed about that too. It claimed that anything, anything that is physical that you can touch, feel, smell, whatever, is sinful. All material things are sinful. That became, and and the Bible doesn't teach that at all. When it talks about the flesh, it's talking about the real you that lives in the flesh. That's what he's really talking about, as opposed to the spirit. The Bible is abundantly clear. The things of the spirit are are the will of God, and the things of the flesh are not. They're your will. 
and your will by nature is self-centered. Do you know anybody who isn't primarily concerned about themselves? That selfishness is the core product, um, the, the, is the core problem that, that makes us sinful people. Because we want what we want as opposed to what God says he wants. Your natural desires are all centered in you. And the struggle between the flesh and the spirit is universal. We all struggle with it, if we're honest. Some have made real progress. We call them godly people or spiritual people. Others are babies. They're Christians. They've been born again, but they've never got past the baby stage. And the result is, and it was assumed in the Bible, but we don't ever talk about it. It was assumed in the Bible that because of that, if you're, ever, if you're winning people to Christ, you're going to have problems in the church. And because the pagan world makes fun of us when there are problems in the church, we don't want to admit that the problems are there, and when a problem arises, we don't even want to deal with it. We just want to hope it goes away. The problem in the church is always going to be if you're winning people to Christ, because you're always going to have baby Christians. And baby Christians still are governed primarily by their selfish desires. Whereas a mature Christian realizes that their selfish desires are a hindrance to the kingdom of God, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and make their decisions based on that. Problems in the church have always been and always will be. It's how we handle them that counts. And this sixth chapter here tells us how we should handle them. Major problems pop up occasionally. Jesus had a problem with Peter. When Jesus was going to the cross, Peter said, I don't know who that sucker is. I don't have anything to do with him. He was frightened for his own safety. Those who are, self, who are governed by the flesh are always going to do things like that. And baby Christians are that way too. So we're in the process of dealing with the problems. We, and sometimes there are even major problems with what we assume are mature believers. Just this past June, one of the guys that I have a great deal of respect for stood before his church. It's a big church, 10,000 members. He stood before them and said, I'm going to have to back off for a while and step down because there's an unconfessed sin in my life. I have no idea what it was. I have no idea what it is now. But I respected him so much that we had been in contact with him off and on about bringing him here for a weekend. His name's Tony Evans. Really a good guy. I wanted, if I'd had the, the money, I, Ralph and I talked about this a lot because he happens to be a black guy. I said, Ralph, you and I ought to get on an airplane and go see him. Because there's a responsibility that the church has for people who, who Christian people get in trouble. What we traditionally do is they're an embarrassment, so we just leave them alone. But that's not what the Bible says to do. Look at the opening verses here. And he's not the only one. One of the guys that I really respected for the years, listened to him on the radio, have met him several times. Alice Kane, I used to go to a meeting in New York every year, and, and, uh, and Ravi Zacharias would, he, for whatever, I think it's because Alice Kane's so pretty, he would, he would come over and sit down with, and, and he liked to hear about Roy Rogers being from here and other things. But we found out later that he had had 
numerous situations where he had cheated on his wife. We didn't learn that until really late. And when that happened, the church turned on him as though he were the devil incarnate. Even though we are embarrassed by it, what does the Bible say we're supposed to do about it? Listen to what he says. Sixth chapter, book of Galatians. He starts off by saying, brethren, so we know we're talking to people. Brothers, we know he's talking to people who are saved. He's talking to Christian people. If anyone is caught in a sin, you who are mature or spiritual should restore him gently. You see the difference between restoration and alienation because you're embarrassed by it? What he's really saying here, because he uses the term brothers on purpose, if that were your physical brother and he did something that embarrassed the family, do you want to kick him out of the family? Or do you want to deal with the problem and get him back where he belongs? The unity of the family is important. It's important. Because the Bible uses the family to illustrate the relationship that should exist between Christian, Christian people. God is the Father. We're all born into the family of God. Even goes to the trouble of, you know, how are you born into this world? There's the bursting of the water of the womb. There's the delivery of the child and the joy of new birth. He uses that concept, and it's in the third chapter of John. He uses that concept to say, this is the way you come into the kingdom of God so you can understand. Baptism is a picture of the bursting of the water, the womb, the coming up, the breath of new life. This time it's eternal and not temporary. That's the picture that, that he tries to show us there. And then you are, and he uses in another instance in the eighth chapter of Romans, he uses the, the, that you're adopted into the family. It's, it's a beautiful picture because under Roman law, once you were adopted into a family, you couldn't be kicked out. Now, the father, and we need that again, the father had life and death powers. Because two of my boys I should have done away with early on. But it happens to be against the law, so I didn't do that. Yeah. And Matthew was one of them. <laughs> Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are mature, or, or, or shall we say, it says spiritual, it means mature in your faith. You go to that person and you help restore them, but do it with a gentle spirit not with I'm looking down at you because you're now less than me because I didn't sin but I did I'm a sinner I know I don't look like one I look like a saint but I'm a sinner and guess what you are too now, it may not be a flagrant sin that causes all of us to be embarrassed on a communal level, but we're all selfish to a degree. And the degree to which we become less selfish, the Bible refers to as being mature. Actually, the problem that developed early in the church among the Protestant and the non-Catholic folks in particular because, you see, Methodism was the one of the first it broke away from uh, the Episcopalians. It was a holiness movement. And it was needed. It really was needed. It was a good thing. And the Wesleys were great Christian people. They were holiness movements. And, and, and the problem with the holiness movement was that it had a tendency to... And, and even developed a, a doctrine that you could l get to the place where you live above sin. That 
sinless perfection became a doctrine of some of the holiness churches. And these are good people, godly people, well-meaning. But it, it assumed then that, hey, I've reached perfection. And that word perfection is there, but it should invariably be interpreted maturity, not perfection. Not because of the, the, the indication that there. Listen, you're not going to get perfect as long as you got skin on. You aren't. And so he says, those of you who, have, who are mature in your faith, who, which means that we're guided by the Spirit more than we are the flesh. That's all it means. You go to him carefully. In fact, you go to him on the basis of let me help you overcome the problem that you're dealing with. There are all kinds of addictions that we refer to today. That's not mentioned in the Bible. In the Bible, it's that the flesh is weak. Peter looked, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, I, I know you're trying. I know you're trying. But the flesh is weak. And you're not governed by the Spirit yet. And Jesus was compassionate toward him. Many years ago, there was a big old German that worshipped here on a faithful, but good Bible teacher too. Great old big guy. His name was David Van Fossen. He and Dora Lee and their two children worshipped here for years. And I'd been fretting about something, and he knew it. I hadn't told him, but you can. I'm I'm not very good at hiding anything. And so, he he came to me and he said, Scott. I, I, I know. I think I remember what it was, but I'm not certain. You see, whenever somebody gets a little ticked off and, and goes to another church, you, you have no idea how that hurts you inside. It just, it just tears your guts out, really. Especially when you know you didn't do anything. They just didn't like the way that you blew your nose or scratched your behind or did something. But it's always silly and trivial. More recently, because we mentioned the, uh, uh, the whole idea that we talk about, that's, they even write books about them and they sell books and they make money. The Bible, doesn't, it's not there and it wasn't mentioned until 1833. But I'll bet you every one of you know the term. Where all of a sudden you're supposed to be driving along you men were driving along, and then all of a sudden, the only one left is your wife. You've been taken up into heaven. So what's that called? The what? It's called the rapture. Everybody knows the term. But you're going to be hard-pressed to defend it biblically. Why? Because it assumes that you all of a sudden are going to go to heaven without dying. You're just going to be gone. Now, I think it's a good idea. And I'd like to pull that off. But unfortunately, the Bible says, number one, we've all sinned, and, and you all just kind of admitted it. I'm proud of you. For it. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And this is in my crawl a little bit, because somebody in the last six months has actually left because of that. And they're really good people. But they really haven't studied the scripture. They have listened to preachers who make money selling books. And they make a lot of money selling books. I'm talking about millions. I'm not talking about a few shekels. Number one. We've, and nobody can argue this. Romans 3. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's you and me. Number two, nobody can argue this. Is that clear in Scripture? 
The wages of sin is death. Now, since we've all sinned, we're all going to die. But in 1833, some girl had eaten some bad stuff for supper, I guess, and had indigestion and came up with an idea saying, a good God will never let people go through terrible stuff. But nowhere in the Bible does it really say that. In fact, it says that if you're a Christian, you're going to suffer. Just rejoice and say, okay, if I'm a rejoicing as a Christian, that's what happened to Jesus. I'm being like him who raised for me. But people want to believe something And it's repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, but it can't be supported in Scripture because here's the way you interpret Scripture. There's even a fancy name for it. You let Scripture interpret Scripture. You don't let some philosopher do it. So if you're studying, uh, if you're studying uh, sanctification, you don't pick out a verse that you like you pick out, you kick all of them, and you see what it says, what the whole Bible says about sanctification. The word sanctification simply means to be set apart for a specific purpose. Hagiadzo in the verb form means that. It doesn't mean, because it doesn't say it anywhere, like the, the woman has to pile her hair on top of her head so that a crow could build a nest in it. It doesn't mean that she has to wear a dress that covers her ankles. It doesn't say that anywhere. It also doesn't say wear one so short you can see their underwear, too. But that, now we're getting into personal preference. That's the only person we ever sent home from church. There was a little girl. She was probably little, little. No, she was a teenager. Maybe I, I, she was in high school. And she was sitting on the front row, right where you are there. And I could see her underwear. And it was before church started. And I told my first wife, I said, first wife, it's awful hard for me to preach and look at her underwear. Alice Kay went to her and told her, she said, do I have time to go home and put on my blue jeans? Alice Kay took her home, put on blue jeans, came back. I could look at the blue jeans without temptation. You can deal with situations that, that are not to be recommended without alienating people. And the idea is, even for those who have done some pretty bad things, that if they're Christians, your, our responsibility is not just to alienate them, but to, it says to restore them. In fact, he says, help them with it. And, and, and I, I go back to Dave Van, Fass, Dave Van Fossen. He came to me and he said, Scott, can I have the other end of the log? I didn't know what he meant at the time. He said, you're carrying the big old heavy log by yourself. Why don't you let me help you carry it? So we sat down and talked about it, and he said, here's what I'll do. I'll check on you every day, and I'll pray with you every day until you feel like this is gone. This is what he had in mind here. He said, each carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's a four-letter word. It's love. Yeah. If you love that guy or you love that lady and, and she's really messed up, let's try to help her get back on the road to recovery and into the relationship with Christ so that she can be governed by the Spirit or he can be governed by the Spirit and not just the flesh. That's, that's the struggle here. Because earlier in the fifth chapter, the Apostle Paul, he said, don't indulge your natural desires. Don't feed those things, even though they feel good. 
Most sin feels good, and we like to feel good. And here's the problem. If anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That's when we really get into trouble. Each one should test your own actions without comparing yourself to somebody else because if this guy had chased off to the and it, even if it's just in his own mind chased off to the holiday inn because he saw some gal with a classy chassis and 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 he commits sin in his mind it is sin Jesus said it was and here's a guy who actually went to the holiday inn and so the problem is the guy who just was tempted and kept it inside, has a tendency to look down on the guy who actually did it, and they're both as guilty as could be. You don't quit comparing ourselves. If you want to compare yourself to somebody, you compare yourself to Jesus. Now we've got the standard by which we can evaluate ourselves and not just judge somebody else. The church has been divided forever. Because we get the, uh, the, the holiness idea of I'm a little better than because I've been sanctified holy. You ain't been sanctified holy. You're as, as sinful as anybody else. You just like to use that term because it makes you feel good because some well-intended preacher said it and said it and said it and said it, and said it until it becomes accepted as fact. The whole rapture thing has been said and said and said and said and said. It never existed anywhere until 1833. But people want to fight about it. And it's the, but the church has always had these problems. Always. And it's how we deal with them. And I'm, I'm not real good at dealing with them yet. I'm still young. I'm working on it. You look over into the book of, of, of 1 Corinthians. See, the Apostle Paul understood that when you're changing people from what they were to what they ought to be, what the Lord wants them to be, there's always going to be a struggle. And he said it this way, listen. First chapter of Corinthians, verse 11. My brothers, same term now. So he's talking to Christians. Some from the household of Chloe have informed me that there are quarrels among you. That's a normal church. What? Some say, I, I follow Paul. Others say, I follow Apollos. Others say, I follow Cephas or Peter. Others say, I follow Christ. Somebody got it right. Is Christ divided? I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and the other two. Then in the third chapter, he, he pursues it even further because he said these, these divisions in the church are there because some are still following the natural desires, while others are saying, let's follow Christ. Let's, be, let's just seek to be godly and spiritual. That should be our goal. For me to live, my goal ought to be, be for me to live as Christ. And nothing short of that. Will we fall short? Yeah, that's what sin is. Paul, the Apostle Paul said again in chapter 3, same term, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, See, these are Christians, but they're not spiritual. They're not being governed by the Holy Spirit. But as worldly, you're being governed by your natural desires. Mere infants in Christ. And Paul said, that's why I had to give you milk instead of meat to eat. <coughs> Excuse me, because you're not ready for it yet. For since there are jealousies and quarreling among you, you're still worldly. The Apostle Paul understood that. And so the, 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 the work of the church is to help people in their struggle of overcoming the selfish desires to getting to the place where we are comfortable being guided by the Holy Spirit. Because you're not comfortable with it. You know, we, we still have people here uh, that... that, that think that they can't have supper without a hootie pole or 
Bud Light or something like that. And, uh, and I have fun with that. Now, I'm very fortunate. I came from a family of alcoholics, drunks. Heck, we made our own. But I was really lucky. I took one drink and got sick as a dog. My brother took me home and put me in the back of an old Model A Ford that was parked in the, in the, uh, in the barn. And, and Dad even milked a cow. I was sick from one drink of whiskey given to me by a cousin, Whitey Freelix. Anyway, I took a little snort. Maybe I took a big snort. I don't know what I took, but I took a something. Got sick as a dog. Dad even milked my three cows for me. And when he finally got me up and said, let's go home and eat supper, I got at home, and Mother was getting ready to cut me a new one. She could do it. She had a t- I mean, she could cut hot butter with her tongue when she's mad. And, and Daddy looked at her and said, Anna, he suffered enough. Leave him alone. You know why I love my daddy? That ought to get across to you. You know why? He'd been a drunk too. Yeah. Now, let's see where we are here. I've got a few more minutes to work on you. <clears throat> he says, and, and this part I really like, because he takes up for the preacher. Hallelujah. Somebody takes up for the preacher. And this goes down to verse 6 here. He says, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share the good tidings with his instructor. Good tidings mean dollars, you know. Now, I know most of you, uh, you know, you think that uh, we live a life of luxury and ease. And compared to most of the world, we, we do. But I, I like what he said about that. Take care of your preacher. You, you know, the idea of how you take care of your preacher. Now, I chose not to take a salary. I worked for a living, da da da, da and did well. I, I'm, I'm not complaining about me. But the concept of how do you take care of the leadership of the church was, was patterned after what the Jews did. The Jews have uh, their own type of church. But they cannot start a congregation in Judaism without ten functioning families. You're not allowed to. You have to have ten functioning families in order to begin. Why? Ten families, tithing, He lives as they live. That's the principle. You, you share, you take care of the leadership because you don't want them because there, there's some terrible things that have happened through the church because of money. Now, the Apostle Paul writes all of this with one thing in the back of his mind that, he do, that doesn't show until much later. What he has in the back of his mind is, how do I deal with the problem that they've created in the churches of telling Errol the men, you must be circumcised. You must be circumcised. When it should be obvious to everybody that circumcision is not of the spirit, it's of the flesh. Because it is a cutting away of the flesh. (coughs) Excuse me. How do you make that argument when they have said circumcision, circumcision, circumcision among the Jews? You have to understand the church is not an effort to restructure Judaism. Jesus said, I've come to do a new thing. It's totally new. But the intended purpose is the same. When God selected the Jewish folks, he told them, here's your responsibility. Here's why you exist. You are to have a relationship with me, God said, 
to be so impressive that the pagan world watching can say, that's a good thing. But what happened to the Israeli folks is they, were, they allowed themselves, the people standing around watching, to influence them more than they influenced the, the, the other folks. And so Paul is going to say here, you're the, the church, you're the new Israel. And your responsibility is exactly the same. Your responsibility is to show the rest of the world who I am by the way you treat each other. For he said the whole law is summed up in this, to love the Lord your God with all, everything that's in your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And your neighbor as yourself. Because he's really saying, you're not doing the first of loving me if you don't do the second. Because the way you demonstrate the first is the way you live the second. And when you love each other, you're willing to sacrifice in order to benefit the other person. That's what agape love is. And if the world can see you doing that, okay, here's, somebody, here's one of your group that, uh, that got caught at Joe's bar and grilled drunk as a skunk, and I've taken more than one home by the nap of the neck. See, the idea, the idea is, how do you help this guy who has been hooked on alcohol, how do you get him to the place where the, the power of the Spirit within you helps him overcome that problem? That's the way it's to be done. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is stronger than any of our natural desires. When you, That's the reason that John wrote, greater is he who's within you, meaning the Holy Spirit than the world's influence on you than who's in the world. That's what, it, when it talks about healing in the church, that's essentially what they're talking about. How do we over... Okay, <coughs> some people have a problem with gossip. Some people have a problem with alcohol. Some people have a problem with overeating. Some people have a, job, have, have a problem with eating and gagging it up. So they say skinny and sexier and socks on a rooster. All of which are problems that need to be overcome. And none of it's easy. And some of it's not even pleasant. Some of it isn't even pleasant. We are to develop a reputation in our world. Remember... We've been chosen to replace Israel in showing the world who God is by the way we treat each other. It would be good if they agreed to it for us sometime to have some testimonies about how some of you have overcome some real problems with the encouragement and the assistance of the church to help you understand this. Because our reputation is, is, is spelled out here. The Apostle Paul, used, in verse 10, uses the term, therefore. Whenever he uses the term, therefore, he is saying, set up and give me at least one ear to listen because this is important. He says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We help people here. We have, at, this, at the end of the month, like this past month, for that last week, we probably get two to three calls a day saying, can you help us with our rent? Can you help us with this? And nearly all of them, and they will say, where do you go to church? Well, I don't go to church. Then why are you asking the church for help? If you, because I'm, I haven't eaten in three days, which is usually a lie. And, and uh, you'd be surprised how, how much of that we have to deal with. But our approach is this. We take care of you first. 
you take care of the, your family first. In fact, the family, your personal family, and then we take care of the family of God. It's the family we take care of. But why? Because Paul wrote to Timothy, he who cares not for his own, especially of his own household, is worse than the infidel. That's where you begin. Even though the world says, you take care of us, you take care of us. <coughs> if we have leftovers, we do. If we have money left over from the, from the little thing back there, and, and someone comes, it's first come, first serve, we try, <clears throat> try to help them. Why? Because we are admonished by the Word of God, impressed upon us by the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God takes the Word of God to create men and women of God. It's not done any other way. Even though our world says, well, you keep, you keep letting your religious till you get the good feelings. Well, you can get good feelings by watching some dumb football player throw a touchdown. Yeah, 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 yeah. If we ever had that kind of excitement in the church, you'd have to call 911 for me. Look, so he's saying this. You need to get your priorities straight. And he ends up by saying, look, if you're going to boast about something, you don't boast about, uh, uh, hey, I've been circumcised. Well, whoop de doo No, he said, I, I, if, I'm going to, if I'm going to brag about something, I'm not going to, <coughs> I'm not going to brag about the fact that that I'm a Kentuckian, and the Kentucky Wildcats have eight national championships hanging from the rafters or up arena. I ain't bragging. I'm just stating fact. And you know I'm lying. Look, the Apostle Paul said, I can brag about who I am and what I've done. Yeah, you can do that. But it's counterproductive to, to our, what we, our, our primary mission is to honor Christ to the extent that the pagan world is impressed by it. So he says it this way. Starting verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing I'm going to brag about. Nothing else. Even though within all of us, because we live in a, in a culture where people are crying out, give me some attention, give me some attention. They put purple hair on pretty girls. They, I mean, they, all, all this silly waste of money on people who are already pretty. Because they're crying out, please, somebody notice me. In the church, there should never be anybody who needs to cry out, please notice me. We should care for one another to the extent that no one ever has a, a loss of self-esteem. You, if you were the only person that ever lived and you sinned, Christ would still have died for you. Jimmy, you're early. He always comes up here to remind us, time to shut up. I'm... <laughs> There's the struggle that we have. And it's really difficult for us. We need a lot of help. We need to help each other in, in establishing our priorities so that we can carry out the objectives that God has given us. The struggle between the spirit and the flesh are always going to be there. We not only need the Holy Spirit to help us, we need each other to help us. And we need to have help not through criticism, but through a volunteer to give me a hand. You know, we're, 
one of the, he was here last night, one of the young fellows here, he's adopted, and I helped pick him out really at the time. But when I, when I come over here to come down after I, I preach, he's always standing here to keep me from falling. Now, that may not seem like much to you, but when you're 88 years old and I'm heading, that, I'm, that's my next step, the worst thing that can happen to you is to fall. I mean, physically, that's the worst thing that can happen to you. Now, it's not going to kill you, but you'll get to go to the hospital, lay in bed, get pneumonia, and die. Falling ain't good. It's to be avoided. And so he knows that. He helps the old man down. And da, 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 da. That same principle is to be implemented in the spirit world, in the church. That's really why we're here. And not any other really good reason. The little piece of cracker and a little shot of juice doesn't have much physical giddy-up to it. Our whole reason for existing as a family of believers is to bear each other's burdens, to encourage people who need encouragement. Barnabas name it the encourager. We need, and we need at times to say, hey, guy, hey now, cool it. There are times when we have to be told, you're, you're, you're out of line, but you want to do it in such a way that the guy knows you're helping and not just being a critic. The church has had the reputation of being primarily critics rather than helpers, rather than bearing each other's burdens. Yeah, I, I could bring people up. He said, oh, so that he ends up by saying, let me tell you what really counts. Nothing else counts. This is what really counts. This is how he ends up. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. I think they, somebody's saying it's time to quit. Sounded like it anyway. And then he goes on and says, you're the new Israel of God. You're it. You're, that's your, what Israel was to do, you're now to do. And that's our, that's our reason for being, our really reason for being. The struggle between the flesh and the spirit are always going to be there until we die. And you are going to die. And I am too. But the beauty of it is because of the cross that we can brag about. We don't have to fear what's beyond death. Death itself is an enemy. It's not good. It's an enemy. The last one we have to face. But you will and I will face it. But beyond that are the open arms of Jesus if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for helping us through your Holy Spirit to understand it and to, and to make it known to people who need to hear it. Help us, O oh Lord, to get our arms around what it means to love one another as a demonstration of how much we love you. And forgive us, Father, when we fail, because all of us have our failings. Sometimes pretty serious ones. But help us to bear each other's burdens, to be quick to forgive just as you have forgiven us. And may we develop with your help the reputation of being people who really care. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I close with this. We had an old drunk here for years, Andy Rhodes. He was a railroad bum for years till he was saved here. And Andy told me one time, he said, you know who the best people on earth are? And I thought he was going to say the church. No, the BPOE. These are the Elks. You know, they always have a bar. <laughs> and he was a drunk. He said, there, I, whenever I needed help, I could always go to the best people. And their name is B-P-O-E, best people on earth, he called them. 
maybe we could develop that reputation. You're free to go. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.